So we're all back at the place where we started. Everything's come kind of full circle uh, after, after the past three days. Uh, you probably know this already. My name is Anthony San Giuliano. Uh, I'm a JD student here at Osgoode Hall Law School uh, and one of the co-organizers of the OLPP grad conference. Um, in a moment, I'll be introducing our closing keynote speaker, Professor Kim Frizan. Uh, but first, I want to just make some closing remarks since we've come to the conclusion of the 2013 Ontario Legal Philosophy Grad Conference. And so basically, I just want to thank uh, a group of people who are able to make this uh, conference possible, starting with all the student presenters who are here today and have been here for the past three days. Um, thank you for presenting, coming to Osgoode and presenting such high quality papers um, and giving us all the opportunity to learn from and with each other over the past three days. Um, a lot of people have traveled far and wide. We have people from uh, California, United States to Italy in, in Europe. Uh, and so we have a really nice international flavor from this conference, and so we thank you for coming so far. Uh, and for bringing such a collegial atmosphere to the, uh, to the conference. It's, I feel like uh, I've met some, I've been able to reacquaint with some old friends, but also make a lot of new ones. Um, uh, I wanna also thank Professor John Gardner, our, our opening uh, keynote speaker, for kicking us off on the right foot. Um, I wanna thank Jeff Callahan, who's just walking in now, and Car Carolina Wisniewski, the other co-organizers of this conference. I think there's been a couple sleepless nights over the past week getting this thing together. Um, also, Liel Gonsalves, who I think Jeff already thanked in the opening, when we opened the conference, she's not here, but we, we can't thank her enough. She's really been the, the gears to make this whole operation go from every last minute she's helped us out with. Um, a few professors I wanna thank for their support, both moral and financial. Um, Professor Will Walachow from McMaster University, uh, Professor Francois tangier Reno here from Osgoode, uh, Professor Michael Judice, who I don't think is here now, from York University, um, and all the other professors that came uh, to help uh, comment on the articles that have been presented, Professor Dan Priel, Professor Stefan Skirafa, uh, and others, and students who weren't officially uh, involved in the conference, but nevertheless came to offer their insight and their assistance where needed. Um, so let's have a round of applause for everybody that's able to put this conference together. All right. uh, now on to our keynote, Professor Kim Frizan. Uh, professor Frizan is a professor of law at Rutgers School of Law in Camden. Uh, she is co-author of the book Crime and Culpability, A Theory of Criminal Law, and author of numerous, uh, numerous articles, uh, including Beyond Intention and Beyond Crime and Punishment. Um, she has main, her main interests are in the philosophy of criminal law and in moral philosophy. Um, and she's recently taken over the uh, editor-in-chief position with her colleague, John Overdijk, of the, law, uh, of the journal Law and Philosophy. So we're very lucky to have Professor Frizan here. Uh, she's gonna be presenting her paper from Defense to Detention, A Theory of Permissible Preventative Force. Um, in your programs that you received at the beginning of the conference, you should have a handout that you can follow along on. Um, and we're gonna be going for, for about an hour, take questions after that. So let's all welcome Professor Frizan. Well, thank you so much for having me uh, here to give this talk today. Um, I know that we've just thanked everybody, but um, as the last presenter, I want to uh, encourage everyone to give a round of applause to the student organizers and the faculty organizers for a fantastic conference. And I, I also want to uh, chime in and thank the participants. Um, as you can tell from this, the title of this talk, I do crim law theory. I don't do uh, general jurisprudence, which many people here did uh, over the last couple days. Um, but the papers were clear, uh, they were engaging, the conversations were so collegial uh, that it, and it was so inspiring, it almost made me want to write in general jurisprudence. Um, Almost, um, but uh, you know, I do crim theory. Lots of people die in my papers. Nobody dies in Dworkin and Hart, and so you know, uh, I'm going to stick with what I like to do. 
All right, so I am working on a book project with the title From Defense to Detention, A Theory of Permissible Defensive Force. And so what I wanted to do today was give you sort of a broad aerial view of the forest instead of an argument about one particular tree or argument. Um, I find whenever I talk about one individual tree lately, everybody wants to point me to a different tree. So we might as well take a look at the forest as a whole. Uh, but I am happy in the Q&A to, to take one leaf on one tree under a microscope scope and uh, talk about that. Uh, so the general thesis is that some preventive measures are justified by an actor's responsible choices. In the same way that a culpable aggressor can be liable to defensive force, so too someone who has initiated a criminal plan can be liable to preventive interference by the state. And this justification is meant to cover terrorists, sex offenders, uh, and even the common criminal. So when I began thinking about preventive detention, it was a few years ago when I was asked to present at an APA panel on what retributivists uh, think about preventive detention. I'm a retributivist. I believe desert is a necessary component to punishment. And so uh, much like John Gardner's first title, my title was something like against preventive detention. Um, but the more that I thought about it, the more that I thought maybe there's actually some interesting space here. So my initial thinking was influenced by uh, what Stephen Morse coins the dessert disease dichotomy. And what he says is there are two ways we can treat people. We either treat them mechanistically or we treat them as practical reasoners. Now, when people are severely mentally ill and the like, it's OK to just predict what they will do and lock them up if they're going to hurt us. But in terms of actual responsible agents, we are supposed to take their autonomy and their liberty seriously, and so we need to resort to the criminal law. Right, so the general objection to prevention is that we could decide someone is dangerous based on facts about him and then predict he will harm us. And this is not autonomy respecting, because we can predict someone will harm us because of their gender, their race, their educational background. But that isn't to trust them. Uh, and to give them the respect that they're due. So as Anthony Duff would say, we're supposed to address this kind of person as a citizen and give him reasons not to commit this offense. So my initial thinking was that these two practices are irreconcilable. You have dessert, which is this backward-looking practice for responsible agents. And you have prevention and prediction, which is fine when we're dealing with the non-responsible. But the criminal law is the only appropriate practice for responsible agents. But what I want to do is challenge the assumption that we cannot have a predictive practice that is grounded in responsible agency. And my model is self-defense, uh, specifically the concept of liability to defensive force. And what I aim to justify is liability to defensive interference. Now, this kind of justification isn't going to cover all preventive practices. I just want to open up new normative and conceptual space for some preventive interferences based on choice and action. These are going to be cases where action isn't just evidentiary of dangerousness. So I'm using the term liability to preventive interference. Let me talk for a moment about what I mean by liability and what I mean by preventive interference. So first, preventive interference. Preventive interference is more than preventive detention. As a model, once upon a time, the UK had something called control orders for suspected terrorists. They now have TPIMs, which by all accounts are pretty much the same thing as control orders. Um, and essentially what you can do to suspected terrorists are things like taking away their passport, imposing curfews, engaging in electronic monitoring, and the like. So the point is that there are other things we can do to substantially interfere with people's liberty short of actually locking them up. Now the term liability. So the term liability comes from the self-defense literature and from Jeff McMahon, who says at least part of what it means to say that a person is liable to attack is that he would not be wronged by being attacked and would have no justified complaint about being attacked. Now, a bit of a confession. I'm using liability today. I hope by the time I write this book to have actually eradicated the use of the term liability from my vocabulary, because I actually think it's adding to more confusion than clarity. 
Um, part of the problem is that when you say that somebody isn't wronged, they cannot be wronged because they never had the right in the first place, they cannot be wronged because they have a duty, they cannot be wronged because they forfeited, and different theorists are using liability in different ways. And so now we're no longer even joining issue when we're talking about the grounds for liability. I'm using liability here today as a limited forfeiture of rights. And I should note that I don't then mean what some people mean by forfeiture, which is you lose something and you can never, ever get it back. Right? We don't think that's true for self-defense. We think that it's more of a temporary loss or suspension of rights for so long as the person poses a threat. But for as long as they pose this threat, they're going to forfeit rights, and that's what I mean by liability and what many other people do as well. Now, liability is also not an all things considered judgment, right? So it can be all things considered impermissible to kill an aggressor, even if that aggressor is liable to defensive force. So if, in fact, John is about to kill me, I like using the audience, sorry. Uh, John is about to kill me, but in order uh, to, to defend myself, I actually have to throw a grenade, and it will take out the three innocent bystanders behind him. Then even though I wouldn't wrong John by killing him, it is not permissible for me to throw the grenade uh, because, in fact, uh, of this concern with the harm to bystanders. So again, liability means you're not gonna wrong the aggressor, but it's not an all things considered judgment. Okay, so a roadmap for what I'm going to do today. Um, I'm gonna first spend some more time talking about self-defense itself and argue that liability to defensive force is based upon culpable action by the aggressor. Uh, and this is to give you a sense of this theory that I'm then going to export. Um, from here, I'm gonna talk about the criminal law and that much of what the criminal law does with early conduct when it punishes, it's really after prevention. And if the true goal is prevention, I'm going to argue that we ought to come clean and do prevention and that this model of self-defense is the best theory for doing this prevention. I'll argue that this approach um, of liability to preventive interference is superior to the use of the criminal law and that it is not itself an instance of the use of the criminal law. All right, and you have a handout in front of you just so you can sort of generally follow along with where the argument's gonna go. I don't think it's necessary. Um, I did see John's had all those little, you, if you'll recall from his PowerPoint, he had checks and X's. There were X's next to almost every line of my handout, I'm a little afraid, um, but um, you, can, uh, you can follow um, along just where the argument's going. All right, so self-defense is a preventive practice. It is aimed at preventing a harm. Now, there are a series of hypotheticals in the self-defense literature. I'm gonna just start with two. Uh, one is the culpable aggressor, right? The culpable aggressor is somebody who says, I am going to kill you and points a gun at you uh, in order to end your life. Uh, the other case that I wanna talk about is the innocent threat, right? These cases first imagined by Robert Nozick, right? So there you are, you're just strolling down the street and oops, you fall down the bottom of a well. And there's your arch enemy and your arch enemy hates you and says, ah, good, you're stuck at the bottom of a well and here is a handy dandy large man and what I'm going to do is shove this large man down the well so he will fall on you and squash you, right? And he will live and you will die. And so uh, then the question is, because it's philosophy, you of course have a ray gun with which to disintegrate people, right? I mean, philosophy would die if we had gun control. So um, here you have your ray gun and you can disintegrate the, the large man. Uh, and so there's the question whether you can and should do this. So there are people who offer defender-centered theories, right? And the people who offer defender-centered theories, like Jonathan Kwong, say you have an agent relative permission to prefer your life to the life of someone else. And so Kwong's gonna say that as between you and the guy pushed down the well, you're allowed to give your life greater weight and choose your life uh, over his. And there may be some ways that you can offer a theory of self-defense and export that to prevention uh, in that kind of way. That's something even Stephen Moore suggests may be possible. That's not the kind of claim that I'm making. I actually think there's a stronger case for why you get to kill the culpable aggressor. I don't think that there's a one-size-fits-all justification for all acts of defensive force and that they're all this defender-centered theory. 
Right? I think we're led astray because we use the term self-defense to apply to a whole range of conduct. Right? You kill the culpable aggressor in self-defense. You kill the innocent threat in self-defense. Guess what? If a rabid dog is about to bite you, you may say, I shot that dog in self-defense. And if you're standing outside in the middle of a tornado and your neighbor's television set is about to whack you in the head and you bang it with a tree branch, you will apologize to your neighbor and then say, sorry, I was acting in self-defense, right? And I don't think we'd be wrong in using the term to cover all of these actions, but it would mean that if we tried to offer one theory to cover all of these actions, it would run roughshod over important moral nuances between these different cases. You just can't have a theory of self-defense that covers killing bad guys and destroying neighbors' television sets, right? It's just not going to work. And so what you want is to attend to the specific facts or the specific reasons in these different cases. Right, so when we think about killing the culpable aggressor, we may think that there are reasons to treat it differently than killing the innocent threat. And so, and that may be because the culpable aggressor has forfeited, I think it's because he has forfeited a right. So what are the trappings that might show us these differences? Um, I think this is a little more complicated than I'm gonna present it for now, but um, I think this will be good enough for illustration. So if you think about compensation, if you think about numbers, if you think about third parties, these are different between the culpable aggressor and the innocent threat, so I'll explain. If you kill a bad guy trying to kill you, you are not going to pay his widow a dime. If you shoot the innocent threat falling down the well, there might actually be an argument that in preferring your life to his, you may owe him compensation. It's possible. Third parties, third parties, upon coming upon the culpable aggressor trying to kill you, they're supposed to help you. They're not supposed to help the bad guy, right? Third party who sees the innocent threat falling down the well, right? Should the third party pick you? Or should the third party pick the guy falling down the well? Should he flip a coin? Should he stay out of it? It's a tougher question, right? It's not remotely clear that he's supposed to side with you. Numbers. 50 bad guys come at you. How many bad guys do you get to kill? 50, right? We're not going to say, oh, the numbers, this is a problem. What if, though, instead of your arch enemy finding a large man to throw down the well, he goes to a nearby hospital and rounds up 50 newborn babies, ties them with twine, and throws a ball of babies down the well at you? See, this is so much more fun than general jurisprudence. Hillary's mortified. So there it is. These, these babies are coming down the well at you. Can you kill them? I think you should, I think you should have a problem killing 50 babies to save yourself. I really do. I think, though, whatever you think about whether you get to give yourself gr life greater weight than the baby, uh, the babies, certainly third parties, don't have a reason to prefer you to 50 babies. And so all of a sudden we see there are real differences between the kind of theory uh, that can be offered to kill the innocent threat as opposed to the kind of theory that can be offered to kill the culpable aggressor. The difference is the culpable aggressor doesn't have a right against you harming him. Right? That's why it doesn't matter that you can aggregate. It's why third parties aren't supposed to help him. Um, he is responsible for this attack, and that's what justifies your response in return. So here's my argument for why a culpable aggressor um, is, is, has lost this right. So I think of forfeiture as being a fitting and appropriate response to a voluntary action. And I don't think that there's one reason why forfeiture will be fitting and appropriate in any given case the same way dessert uh, doesn't mean the same thing for why you deserve a medal and why you deserve to go to jail. There may be different reasons you forfeit different rights in different times. But for culpable aggressors, I tend to think of forfeiture as a kind of normative disgorgement. So to take a case of what I think is clear normative disgorgement, uh, in the US constitutional law, criminal defendants have a right to confront their accusers. Right? They have a right to confront witnesses. You can't just introduce their hearsay statements. Now, what happens when a criminal defendant decides to kill the witness, right? to prevent her from testifying? Right? Can he then turn around and say, well, you can't introduce her hearsay. Right? I have the right to confront her. Yes, I killed her. But now you can't introduce her hearsay because I have this right to confront witnesses. And the answer to that, the Supreme Court's answer, is there's a thing called forfeiture by wrongdoing. 
right? I mean, it would be positively bizarre for our moral entitlements to be such that we can positively benefit from wrongdoing, that you can kill your witness and then get to stand on your rights. And I think self-defense works a little bit like this as well, that when an aggressor chooses to harm another person for no good reason, he's treating his victim as if she did not have rights. If she were not permitted to defend against him, then he would, in an important sense, be better off. He could ignore her rights while having his respected. Right? He can be aiming to violate someone else's rights while still saying, I have claim rights that you cannot interfere with me. What forfeiture does then is to step in to bring him back to where he belongs, that for as long as he isn't respecting her rights, he does not have rights against defensive force. So specifically, I think that it's when a an actor forms a culpable intention, meaning that he will purposefully, knowingly, or recklessly harm another, and that action is not excused or justified, his insufficient concern for her rights results in a loss of a claim right against defensive harmings. And I actually think that for this, the act requirement for this sort of aggression is, on the moral level at least, just the formation of the culpable intention. Now, I'm not offering a, a full theory of um, the grounding of forfeiture here. I know I actually need to do some more work on this. One thing I'm wor worried about is I think that there really needs to be a tight fit between what the person does and why they lose the right. And there's a lot of loose talk about reciprocity, and I think loose talk about reciprocity gets forfeiture in trouble. And you see that particularly in the punishment context. So if you think about somebody who has violated somebody else's rights, and then you, the forfeiture theorists who want to say, well, now, because of that, he hasn't respected somebody's rights, so we don't have to respect his. Well, what can we do to him? Do we get to boil him in oil because he didn't respect us, so we get to respect him? What does this mean in terms of, do, does it mean if he's a rapist, you rape him? I mean, it's very confusing and incredibly normatively unattractive. And I don't think that self-defense needs to make uh, such a robust claim. All you have to say is that for so long as someone isn't respecting the defender's rights, the defender is going to have the ability to push back that attack. But we don't have to get into some sort of global uh, forfeiture based on reciprocity. Uh, but I hope that I can at least leave specifying the precise moral mechanics of this for another day. So I want to put one more actor uh, into play. Uh, and that is the culpable apparent threat. Because actually, in many cases, uh, even though actors look like they will cause harm and we stop them, it turns out that the actor would have missed or would have changed her mind, et cetera. And so one thing that I've worked on is what happens when somebody is actually something like bluffing and has an unloaded gun. Do you wrong the bluffer when you shoot the bluffer? And I think that that actually is also forfeiture, but has independent grounding, what I call forfeiture by insincerity. That in fact, when an aggressor manipulates or misleads another into potentially wronging him, that in fact, they forfeit those rights. That is, even though from a fact relative perspective, it would have otherwise been unnecessary, the fact that one person causes someone else's beliefs can actually change the moral furniture in a way where somebody can forfeit a right. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time today defending that view, except that it's important to note that what it does is it yields that even mistaken predictions do not always wrong aggressors. That when people are culpably attacking us, when they give us reason to believe we're being threatened, that we in fact do not wrong them when we act defensively, even in some cases when that defensive action would not have been actually necessary. So where are we? So just to this point, I've argued that culpable aggressors and culpable apparent threats forfeit rights such that defenders don't wrong the aggressors when they act defensively. And of course, there's a lot more in terms of self-defense that can be said about proportionality uh, and necessity. Um, I do think that attacks have to be proportional. I think that defenders actually have to believe their force is necessary. Uh, and, and we could discuss more of that in the Q&A, but it's not necessary to where we want to go today. So this leads to the question, right, do I have the account of forfeiture rights? So before we start exporting this to preventive detention by the state, right, 
I have a very narrow view. I think it's only culpable aggressors who forfeit. Uh, no one thinks that culpable aggressors don't forfeit, right? They actually have broader views. And I, th I think that there's special cases for culpable apparent threats. And even people who think that they don't have theories for culpable apparent threats wind up with theories for culpable apparent threats. So really the question is, is culpability necessary? Um, and my view is that culpability is necessary to liability. It's necessary to forfeiture. Right, which is one way that it's permissible to harm other people. Um, but I want to tread carefully here. So let's talk for just a minute about Jeff McMahon's conscientious driver. Jeff McMahon has a theory that, in fact, uh, you have a driver who's driving along the road. He maintains his car. It's in perfect shape. And for no good reason, it suddenly malfunctions and goes careening towards a pedestrian. And McMahon argues that the pedestrian is entitled to shoot the driver. Uh, he says that the driver is liable to defensive force under what he calls a moral responsibility account, which is basically if you take a foreseeable risk, right? And even though it's evidence relative justified, even though a reasonable person would take it under the circumstances, if it turns out you're wrong, it's fact relative unjustified, Right? and you knew you were taking a risk, you are the one who is liable to be killed. I think if we're talking about liability, and liability is limited forfeiture, McMahon's condition is too strong. First of all, it ignores that the pedestrian also takes a risk. Right? Imagine that we tweak the facts just a little. The pedestrian can take a different road, or take a different path so he's not walking so closely to the highway. And the driver is an ambulance driver fulfilling a public duty. Now, it's not remotely clear why we should prefer the pedestrian over the driver. It also seems that the moral responsibility view cannot survive aggregation. Let's make it 100 conscientious drivers and one pedestrian. Do you really think that we should favor one pedestrian over 100 of these drivers? Interestingly, even McMahon is beginning to doubt this. Uh, but that means that McMahon hasn't captured forfeiture. The reason McMahon, uh, McMahon's moral responsibility account cannot be sufficient for forfeiture is because forfeiture ought to be non-comparative. Right? It's not about comparing between two people which one should get a harm. That's not what forfeiture is about. McMahon is looking for a distributive principle. But once we're comparing drivers and pedestrians, we're going to want to ask a range of questions, questions that might, in fact, go beyond this one incident. I don't deny that in some self-defense cases, we're going to have to make tough moral choices between innocent people. We saw that with the innocent threat. What I do deny is that the moral responsibility account is a forfeiture account, and that its one-sided analysis can capture the comparative principle at work in instances where neither party is culpable. Okay, so to this point, I've just sketched out the self-defense view. Liability to defensive force is based on forfeiture, and the grounds for that forfeiture are culpability. By culpability, I mean that the aggressor will harm the defender intentionally, uh, knowingly, or recklessly, and without justification or excuse, or that the putative aggressor has culpably chosen to appear to be a threat. And so what is important is that the culpable aggressor is the responsible agent and that it is by his action that he loses claim rights against others, uh, injuring him to stop him. So this is clearly a preventive practice where we are stopping a future harm grounded in responsible agency. This already shows the falsity of the desert disease dichotomy with which we began, right? Sometimes what a responsible agent does justifies our making predictions on what he will do. So now, how does this look in terms of the criminal law? I want to apply liability to preventive interference before the commission of a crime. When a responsible agent culpably embarks on a criminal path, this choice grounds the state's right to intervene to stop the agent from committing that crime. People recognize that there's some prevention going on in the criminal law. Stephen Morse, Paul Robinson, Paul Robinson says we cloak uh, prevention as punishment. Criminal law should get out of the prevention business. And so let's think about how the criminal law currently engages in prevention. So imagine that we have a continuum. At the end of this continuum, I'm going to kill John Gardner. 
Um, but this continuum begins. <laughs> We'll never get there. The state will intervene many a time, right? So uh, how does this start? Well, I could possess burglar's tools, right? What are burglar's tools? A crowbar, a screwdriver. Guess what? You all probably possess burglar's tools. Um, then I could form the intention. Gee, it'd be really nice to break into John's house and kill him. Then I can lie in wait outside his house. Then I can walk up. Then I can open the window, et cetera, et cetera, until I eventually uh, kill John. Right. So how does the criminal law deal with this? They deal with this through attempts and through preparatory crimes. Let's tar start with attempts. So attempts, where is this line? In this entire continuum, one question is, where do we, make, where do we place the act requirement for an attempt? Right? At what point does it become an attempt? And we get pulled in two different directions. In some ways, we want the defendant to get really close to completion because we know that there are plenty of times that people won't follow through on their intentions, right? We want to give them time to listen to the criminal law, think that this is a bad idea, and you know, for me to decide I'd rather you know, watch some reality television than kill John Gardner. On the other hand, we want this to be as early along the continuum as possible. Why? Because people with criminal plans are scary, dangerous people, and we would like the state to stop them as soon as possible. Right? I mean, is the police officer really supposed to sit there twiddling his thumbs while I'm lying in wait? Nope, she's not close enough to the attempt yet. We gotta wait a few more steps, right? John's nervous. He's sitting in his house and he's nervous I could kill him, and he would like the state to do something about this. But the question is, if what we're nervous about is prevention, if what we're nervous about is how do we stop dangerous actors with culpable intentions, shouldn't we just come clean and say we're doing prevention instead of contorting the notion of a crime? So consider a real case of State versus Reeves, where the defendant was found to be a delinquent child uh, because she attempted second degree murder. So, Tracy Reeves and her good buddy Molly Kaufman decided it, they would like to kill, that's right, kill their middle school homeroom teacher, and so they decided to bring rat poison to school to stick in her coffee. And they, in fact, put the rat poison in the purse, they get on the bus, one of them brags to another student, the student, of course, ratted them out, which is why we have the case, pardon the pun with rat poisoning and ratting them out. Um, and they get as far as the purse winds up next to the coffee cup. And so the question is, is this enough to be an attempt? Early Tennessee law had actually required something close to dangerous proximity. It wasn't remotely clear it was going to be good enough under earlier Tennessee precedent, but Tennessee had just adopted the Model Penal Code substantial step test. And so the court reasoned, the shortcomings of the prior precedent with respect to the goal of prevention are particularly evident in this case. As stated above, it is likely that under the prior precedent, no criminal responsibility would have attached unless the poison had actually been placed in the teacher's cup. This rigid requirement, however, severely undercuts the objective of prevention because of the surreptitious nature of the act of poisoning. Once a person secretly places a toxic substance into a container from which another person is likely to eat or drink, the damage is done. There's no discussion in that opinion about culpability, about blame, about what the point is at which the state should say, this is the time we should punish someone. This is a discussion about prevention. If we're going to do prevention, why, why are we saying we're doing punishment? Why not come out and say, this is about prevention? How else do we know that attempt law is concerned with prevention? The defense of abandonment. Right, here I am. I've crossed the line of substantial step. Right? I'm, I'm liable in any model penal code jurisdiction. And I keep going and I keep going. And then I decide that there's some good reality TV on and I'm not going to kill John Gardner and I go home. So guess what? The minute I change my mind, there's no crime. We don't care how far I've come. We only care about what I would have done. And, and you can see that the law only cares about prevention because so long as I don't harm him or pu you know, pull the trigger and miss, we say, you get to erase what you have done. 
That means that what the criminal law is doing in these cases is really trying to get at prevention and not at something they think is really deserving of criminal punishment. Now consider preparatory crimes. We have tons of preparatory crimes. They should scare you. This is what happens. We have courts that decide where an attempt should be. They decide where an attempt should be, we would hope, based on some principle about this, when the state ought to intervene. And everything before that isn't supposed to be criminal, right? That's what you would think. But we still are scared. We're scared of dangerous, scary, creepy people with intentions. And legislators are scared. And so they enact earlier preparatory offenses. So take the crime of um, have, uh, having sex with a minor, sexual predators. Somebody might attempt at some point to have sex with a minor. But what about the steps before that? No problem. We'll just create a new crime called enticing a child over the internet. And so we place crimes earlier and earlier along the continuum, right? Despite the fact that if the rationale is this isn't good enough for an attempt, it shouldn't be good enough for a crime at all. And then you should be really worried, because guess what you could do? You could attempt to entice a child over the internet, right? I think that's buying a computer, right? So this is incredibly scary stuff in terms of how early along the continuum all of a sudden the criminal law is reaching because we're concerned about prevention. But if we're going to do prevention, why not say this is what we're doing and do it the right way? Stop sticking it in the criminal law. Have liability to preventive interference. Right? So a potential victim can be justified in stopping an offender in his tracks. But we have, have, of course, allocated most of our defensive rights to the state. And the state is supposed to stop these people. They're supposed to protect us. And an aggressor who harbors a culpable intention may be stopped for as long as he harbors that culpable intention. So why not think that we can use the formation of the intention, plus an act, because we should be worried about the state punishing us for thoughts or making things up, as grounds for preventively interfering and stopping the offender. If an actor intends to commit a crime and acts on that intention, then just as a defender can stop an aggressor, the state may intervene to stop a would-be criminal. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that the government is acting in self-defense. Rather, I'm arguing that the very principles by which a culpable aggressor renders himself liable to defensive force and is therefore not wronged by preventive interferences are equally applicable when the state aims to stop the aggressor from harming others. It is certainly the case that because the state has significant resources and perhaps the luxury of time, that the state will not operate in the same stop them in their tracks way that an individual must in a case of self-defense. And thus, although the differences between the citizen and the state may lead to different implications for the types of preventive interferences that are permissible in the context, the point that the aggressor has forfeited his claim right against such actions remains. Therefore, it is possible to have an autonomy-respecting preventive regime. Now, obviously, this regime needs a lot of work, like a constitutional burden of proof, determining who the fact finder is, terrorism makes things complicated with secret evidence, but at least there's a theoretical justification for the state's interference to stop a responsible offender, even short of state punishment. So let's talk about a real case. Earl Schreiner, right? We lock people up as sexual predators, mainly because of Earl Schreiner. So, he was released from prison in May of 1987 after completing a 10-year sentence for assaulting two teenage girls. And officials weren't worried about releasing him because of just some diagnosis that he was a pedophile. They were worried about releasing him because he had repeatedly written in his diary detailed plans to maim and kill children. And he had told one of his cellmates that what he wanted to do was customize a van with cages so he could pick children up and molest them and kill them. So let's assume that we're convinced he has a firm intention, right? And admittedly, he doesn't even have a, a particular child in mind. But from an omniscient point of view, the child that he would later rape and strangle and leave in the woods to die should at some point be entitled to stop him. And I submit that at the moment that Schreiner formed that intention, he becomes liable to defensive force by that child and third-party defenders. Now, admittedly, this is going to put tremendous pressure on the moment of forming the culpable intention, 
right, to respect autonomy, I think you need to form the culpable intention. I don't think the child who would later become Shriner can just be locked up because one day he might become this. I think that to have an autonomy respecting regime, we do need a degree of choice and freedom to do right and wrong. But the forfeiture of the claim right against defensive force is fitting and appropriate when the actor makes the decision not to respect the rights of another. It is at this moment that he views himself as above the baseline of claim rights of others, and forfeiture shifts the aggressor's entitlement because of his choice to violate another's rights. If the only way to stop Earl Schreiner from killing that boy was to shoot him one minute after he formed that intention, he would have no grounds for complaint because it would be at that moment that he ceased to attribute to others their full moral status. Now, with a preventive regime, the state can step in. Now, we do, of course, want an act requirement to constrain the state from punishing people for thoughts, but certainly expressing his intention to others, writing those things in his diary, should count as good enough. And then, of course, the state should step in to do something. Right now, we do this with sexual predators, but we do this based on these volitional tests, which uh, are incredibly problematic. Instead, we say here, not that there's a control deficit, but that for as long as he harbors a criminal intention, he forfeits rights against the state interfering to stop him. In many cases, right, that won't require locking someone up. In Shriner's case, it very well might have, right? And then, of course, certainly we'd have to have procedures to review, does he still harbor this intention? When can he prove he doesn't have this? Obviously, there are complicated procedures in terms of keeping track of when the state should be intervening and for how long. But the theoretical justification for detaining a sexual predator here is because he actually has the intention and he therefore forfeits rights against people stopping him. Now, how does this compare to the criminal law, right? Is going to this regime better than the criminal law, right? I mean, I tell people this and people actually think I'm scary. I was compared, at one point somebody told me to read Korematsu. Um, but there, you know, I, I have to say that I, I have a belief that if we have a better theoretical justification for something, certainly in, non -ide in the non-ideal world, anything can be destroyed and we have to set up protections against it. But the question is, what's the best theoretical justification for that? And then how much are we willing to compromise uh, because, um, human beings uh, are imperfect. So how does this compare? Why not just do this through the criminal law? Go the path of least resistance. All right, so first of all, notice again that this is an autonomy respecting regime. It's conceptually possible to have an autonomy respecting regime other than the criminal law, right? We're not relying on naked statistical evidence, um, but taking seriously the actor's own choice and actions. And intervention is based on taking his intentions seriously. We respect someone's autonomy when we believe that that person will follow through with his promise or plan. There are also huge advantages to being on the civil side. Uh, and Victor Tadros noted some of these with respect to control orders, right? So first, as I just said, it allows uh, the state to do this. It's to do prevention in the most defensible way instead of just cloaking this as an instance of the criminal law. Second, it doesn't brand someone a criminal. And whether collateral consequences follow, right, is a very different question. In criminal law, there are a lot of collateral consequences to being branded a criminal. Third and most importantly, because it asks the right question, it's gonna give you the right answer. When we criminalize, we often have overbroad rules and we ensnare individuals who wouldn't have committed the offense. Right, if you think back to something like possession of burglar's tools, we want to lock this person up because of fear of what that person will do. But what if that person would have changed his mind? There's absolutely no way under current criminal law for him to say, look, I'm not going to do it. Don't punish me. Whereas under this regime, the regime is only justified, the state's interference is only justified for so long as that intention is harbored. So the minute the person changes his mind, the state goes away. Now, another objection in terms of the criminal law versus civil aspect is that I keep acting like there's this sharp dichotomy between criminal law and prevention, right? And that's why prevention now has to be cast out in the sunlight. But it is, of course, undoubtedly true that criminal law uh, has aspects of prevention in it. 
right? So first of all, criminalization is about prevention. We criminalize things to denounce certain wrongs so people won't do them. In a world of limited resources, which people we choose to punish more likely to be the people we think are dangerous. Third, the mode of punishment, whether we lock people up or fine them or chop off their hands, the mode is might be determined by whether or not we want to incapacitate them. So it isn't as though the criminal law has a dash of prevention in it. The criminal law is shot full of prevention. And I'm willing to concede this. But the question is the justification for punishment. I justify punishment by desert. I don't justify punishment by prevention. Otherwise, every regulation could be a crime. Although most punishment will therefore come with a dash, if not two cups of prevention, the converse is not true. A preventive regime that focuses on dangerous propensities due to age, gender, race, or genetics need not require the actor to do anything, much less anything blameworthy. Still, let me contrast this approach with the argument made by Doug Husack that we can get at actors like Schreiner through the use of the criminal law. So Doug actually recently wrote a paper that everything we want to do with preventive justice, we can actually do through the criminal law itself. So Husack thinks we can criminalize something like having an intention. So why, go, why not just go the path of least resistance and stick this in the criminal law? So I have a couple concerns about using the criminal law, and Husak's sensitive to them, but I don't think he's fully responsive. First, Husak thinks that preventive detention can be recast as punishment because of the stigma, right? When we lock these people up, we're stigmatizing them. That looks like criminal law. But I disagree, right? There's no doubt that this system will have stigma. It's an inevitable side effect. The difference is that this system doesn't aim at stigmatizing. And if we could actually lock people up without stigmatizing them, that would be perfectly fine. So that's actually a real difference between the criminal law and this preventive system. Second, there's a real problem with proportionality, right? How long do we get to lock people up? So I actually have rather idiosyncratic views about attempts, but I'm not going to defend my idiosyncratic views right now. I'm going to actually take the conventional wisdom. So the conventional wisdom is that when you have somebody really early on, when you do one of these preparatory offenses, you're supposed to steeply discount the amount of punishment that the person deserves, right? Somebody like Andrew Ashworth and Lucia Zedner say, when you're really far away from the commission of the offense, that shouldn't have a lot of punishment. And uh, when Paul Robinson and John Darley looked at this empirically, they found, you know, the common man on the street thinks that there's a little bit more punishment earned until you get to something like uh, dangerously close. And then, boom, it shoots up dramatically. So the average person, many theorists think there's very little punishment early on. But what that means is that Husak can't possibly get to lock the people up the way that we want to lock them up, because dessert can be exhausted before our preventive needs are, right? For if this person harbors this intention, the little teeny bit of dessert isn't what's doing the work, it's all the prevention that is doing this work. So think about it this way. Assume we've got two actors, and they in fact both harbor this criminal intention and one abandons the intention and the other person doesn't abandon the intention. Do we put them both in jail for the same amount of time? On a dessert theory, you should put them in jail for the same amount, if you think they've got dessert, they've got the same amount of dessert. Now Husak could say, well this person is prevention because he still harbors the intention. But that actually, we'd have to get our calculators out, right? Because it might be that even the guy who abandoned his intention will give us lots of good consequences by locking him up, by deterring other people, right? So there may be no reason to treat these two people differently in terms of giving them both the full amount of punishment they deserve. So then Husak has an answer to this. He says, for as long as the person harbors the intention, you have a continuing offense. So it's not that we just stop here. The guy who has the intention, his offense continues and continues and continues, and therefore I can get extra dessert, and therefore I can lock this person up. But I think it's at least debatable that harboring a criminal intention is like possessing stolen goods, where the amount of time actually increases the amount of dessert just because of the sheer amount of time. If I take Francois's painting and I keep it for five years, we can see why, don't shake your head, um, 
you, you're not, you're not going to consent. Of course you're not going to consent. So I, I, I take his painting. I keep it for five years. Um, it seems that every day I keep the painting. That's something he doesn't have, and therefore my punishment should increase for every day of those five years. But what if I just decide I'm going to kill him five years from now, write it down in my diary, and then just go about my business? Is it clear that for every day that I harbor that intention, my dessert grows? It's at least debatable whether that functions in the same sort of way. So it's not clear that Husak making this a continuing offense can do exactly what he wants it to do. Moreover, even if it's a continuing offense, at the moment you catch them, you're punishing them for whatever they did for some amount of time. But what we want to do is we want to say, we want to keep you for exactly the amount of time you harbor the intention, and not one day more. So Husak's view is going to be insufficiently nimble to actually do the prevention that we want it to do. All right, so last concerns. Am I already doing criminal law? Right? So there are, I'm in Canada, and this is the Canadian objection. Right, This is the Vincent Chow objection. Um, so I don't know much about Canadian law or the charter, but I do know my little exposure is that, in fact, um, any substantial deprivation of liberty triggers what Americans think of as criminal procedural rights. And so in a forthcoming paper in Law and Philosophy, Vincent Chow argues that, in fact, the category of criminal is broader than the category of punishment. Right? So Chow would say, you're already doing criminal law. You're substantially interfering with people's rights. Sure, it's not punishment, uh, but it's criminal law. Now, I agree that there may be times that procedural rights right, should actually turn on the liberty deprivation and not on what we call it. But I'm going to stubbornly insist that we call this regime civil. One thing I think we should worry about is letting procedural tales wag substantive dogs, right? So Andrew Ashworth and Lucia Zedner are very worried that what the state does now is they take things that are criminal and they call them civil so that people don't get criminal procedural rights, right? And so they call this the problem of undercriminalization. And I think we should just call these things civil, if they're civil, but that that doesn't entail anything about what procedural rights the person can be entitled to. It may very well be that you're entitled to certain procedural rights even in a civil regime. In fact, in a recent paper, I wind up concluding that the regime I propose requires proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, there's one final, perhaps more damning objection, which is that I require a culpable intention. So it's one thing to allow civil remedies to hang on non-criminal acts or mental states, but not quite another to say, the state may intervene because of your evil intentions. But when the state locks you up for your evil intentions, it isn't saying anything stigmatizing about them. Right? How, one might ask, is this not already criminal law? But I actually think there's nothing wrong with this. So if you think about civil fraud, we have fraud that's based on criminal intention. If you think about intentional torts, we have torts based on purposefully harming another. And I take it we think there's nothing problematic with a cop when he shoots the robber and not the homeowner, saying, I am shooting you because you're culpably trying to harm another, but I'm not stigmatizing you at the time I'm making this decision. So ultimately, I don't think we should deny the conceptual possibility that the state could premise its action on culpability, but act without intending to convey stigma. And again, nothing about this delineation determines the procedural guarantees of the system. So my worry about the criminal law is that our obsession with risk has led us to rampant overcriminalization, and placing prevention under the criminal law, even if sometimes it would tame prevention, threatens to further distort a practice that is already incredibly troubling. I would rather see us start fresh with prevention. So let's do prevention and think through how prevention ought to work. Ultimately, I am centrally guided by core commitments that I have to the criminal law. I am a proud card-carrying retributivist. I, I think dessert is a necessary component of punishment. I simply refuse to distort and defile the criminal law by recasting prevention as crime. I am not sharing the criminal law with purely preventive aspirations. 
not when there exists an entirely different premise for state action in the form of liability to preventive interference. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Frizan. So just like our first keynote, if you have any questions, just approach the mic. Let, let me start. I might have other questions. This is just one. I'm still thinking about my question, so this is not going to be the most difficult one. But uh, so, so well, it, it, might, it might end up being, but I, I, I don't know. So, so you say initially in passing that you think, and we've talked a bit about this, that you think liability is not really where, it's not really a useful concept. Um, and I'm wondering if, if that's the case, right? I'm wondering if, if um, so, so Jeff McMahon coins this term, and what he has in mind, it seems, however he does define the criteria of liability, is to say, in uh, the distribution of harm, in society, there are going to be certain factors that matter. For him, it seems to be primarily responsibility. And those, some of these factors will be, will be uh, individual specific. What individuals do ought to be understood in a certain way, and that might warrant a certain response, right? It has to be narrowly proportionate, he says. And then, and then there are all these other factors uh, that don't have to do with the individual, right? Uh, which might still uh, factor in what one can do to the individual, right? So, so they, which, which, which relate to what he calls wide, wide proportionality. Uh, so I'm wondering whether the, uh, the, the right way to start the inquiry, and, and that's not my initial intuition, but listening to you speak and thinking about this a bit more is not to say, well, the, 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 the ultimate question is a distributive question. What harm is its currency, right? How do we shift harm and how can we permissibly shift harm around? And there's going to be certain criteria that have to do with what individuals do, and, and, and others that have to do with something else, right? The, the wide proportionality. And, and forfeiture is just one of those individual criteria, and they fit within that individual category. And let's call that category liability, right? Because presumably there's a distinction between what individuals do, and, and, or at least cause, or whatever the, the ground may be, and what, you know, what, what, what else is there in the world, right? So I'm wondering whether that distinction isn't important, because you're really saying, well, within liability, there might be different criteria, and I'm going to focus only on, on forfeiture, right? That's one thing individuals might do. They might in culpably intend to do certain things, and that might result in them being, uh, having harm permissibly imposed on them, at least pro tanto, before uh, we do the whole calculus of, of, of white, we include the whole calculus of white proportionality. But there might, also, there might also be, you say, duty. You might also be the fact that they simply have no right. There might simply be the fact that they have, that they're, that they have consented, right? And, and I say, well, that, that's one ground of inquiry. Let's just, focus on, let's just focus on individual aggressors or attackers or threat and, and say what you can say about those. Forfeiture is just one of them. And then let's think about how that fits in the global picture. And only then will we have a, 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 an overall picture of what's permissible to do. Uh, is that the kind of, of overall picture that you have when you say, I'm just focusing on, on forfeiture? And if, if that's the case, then, well, you have forfeiture. There might be other grants. Those might, fight within the, might fall within the category of liability. And liability is just one part of the overall equation. And, and so it's just one distinction amongst many. We don't need to get rid of it. It points us to a certain class of salient considerations. It just doesn't do the work that McMahon claims it does, that is this, this magic concept that's going to help us solve the, 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 the self-defensive equation. Yeah. So I'm, you can stay there, because I'm going to ask you questions. Okay. Do, do you think, <laughs> yeah. this is the great professor trick, right? You ask questions. Yeah, no, that's fine, fine. No, no, so do, are you okay. arguing that the sort of Tadros view that liability is this broad category is the better way to go? I'm just trying to see if that. Well, the, the, so Tatros doesn't claim that liability is a broad category, right? He, 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 like you, says, well, actually, your view might be broader. He says, you know, individuals have a duty to incur harm in some way because of what they have done, and that, that is liability, right? So, so that, that's a, that could just be a criterion of liability. So, right? so well, but, okay, 
a couple things. Let, let me just start by answering okay. the question, then I'll tell you what I think okay. Victor says. Um, so I think the problem, though, is that nobody's, it would be fine if we really all agreed on what we mean by liability. So sometimes liability seems to be an input in the argument, and sometimes it seems to be an output of the argument. Right. And I think that's really problematic. So take, um, Saba Bazargan has a recent argument that people like conscientious driver are what he calls minimally responsible threats, right. right? And so what he says is that they're liable to a little bit, right? And then then we we do liability and then we do lesser evils and out pops that you get the pedestrian gets to kill the right. conscientious driver, but some of it's lesser evils, so you owe him some compensation, right. right? Okay. So then liability becomes sort of input in comparative things. There are other times that Jeff seems to think liability is output. Right. You do the comparison and the person you conclude is the one who's gonna die, that's the one who's liable. Mm. So the problem is, at some point, we're just not using the term in the same right. way. And it might be that if we could settle on something, that it would do, you know, it'd be just a nice sort of mid-level thing to say that, that bottoms out in different justifications. The concern I have is that what's happening now is that no one even right. means the same thing, right? So if you're McMahon and you think liability is forfeiture and that necessity is an element of liability, and I think it's forfeiture but necessity isn't an element of liability, all of a sudden, you know, are, are we talking to each other? Are we talking past each other? It's kind of impossible right. to tell. So. I, I, at the most recent self-defense conference, my plea was just like, can we just be clear on what's doing all the moral work? And then if we want to agree on some labels, I'd be perfectly happy to do that. But I'm just very concerned that we're not joining issue anymore. Because I, I thought the important move for McMahon was to say there are agent-centered considerations, and then there are those other considerations. And in the context, for example, of the criminal law, we tend to focus just on the aggressor, but we tend to for, forget about the other consequences, right? War allows you to say, okay, let's, let's, let's think more, more broadly. And those agent-centered considerations are responsibility for him. And, and Saba being a student is minimal responsibility is in the same line, right? But there could be other reasons which are agent-centered and forfeiture being one of them. And that is within those, those, those considerations that have to do with liability, as it were. But, so, but McMahon concedes that reciprocal riskers aren't liable to each other. Yeah. He's now conceding that contributory negligence can yeah. matter to who's liable. He says that assumption risk can matter to liability. So right. he's not really, he's doing this sort of My sense, I've seen him in conferences starting to doubt that, like everybody's putting pressure on that example, yeah. and you're right to do it, right? Yeah. But to the extent that he backs out on that one example, then that leaves him to say, well, responsibility is an agent-centered consideration. And he wants to say, well, it's not just responsibility, it's forfeiture. But maybe responsibility can do some work. I, well, other, okay. I think McMahon and I are probably closer on what liability right. and forfeiture mean than many other people. It's more right. just a matter of people who, particularly people who don't work in the self-defense area, if you're not paying attention, you don't right. necessarily recognize that th this, this label is really getting people confused. Right. Because in your analysis, you're still focusing on the agent center yeah. issue, right? So, so to the extent that what I'm going to do to the person who suddenly intends and makes a step in that direction, uh, you say, well, that's just an, it's not an all, th all things considered judgment, right? The state will have to think what else is going to happen. And, yep. Okay, no, I'm yeah. okay with that. Hi. Um, I had a question about the uh, way in which you're flushing out how this preventative framework would work. Um, could you just say a little bit more about what it means to form an intention? Because you, you then refer to, um, you know, we can uh, abandon intentions, or when an intention is formed, that might give one the right, or, or whatever word we want to use, to stop one, right? Mm -hmm. So is, um, is an intention something like um, developing a plan for action? Because it's something to be abandoned or something that can be stopped. Right, so um, because I'm, you know, I'm worried about this punishing for thoughts alone thing. Uh, not punishing, sorry, but um, right, right. <laughs> restraining for thoughts alone. Um, so could you just quickly say something yeah, about I, that? Yeah, I do think of it as sort of a, a choice mm -hmm. to, in the future, ca cause harm for an unjustifiable reason. Right, so it's, it's going to be geared to, the intentions will be geared to things that are already you know, prohibited, right, mm -hmm. because they harm other people's legally protected interests. Um, the, the nice thing, I think, mainly about criminal law is you don't sort of just have 
intentions happen to you. I mean, there are right. some things we do by right. reflex, et cetera, but the decisions to you know, harm other people are things we have control over, reflecting mm -hmm. over, and deciding whether to do or not. Mm -hmm. So um, just a, sorry, a quick follow-up. So setting the end is not gonna be enough then to form the intention. Is that, is that right? It's gonna, and not, not just like, I'm going to kill X, but it's something, it, wouldn't it, would it need to be responsive to like how I might do that, start setting in motion? No, actually, I think okay. setting the end would be, I mean, the would sort of manian, you know, mm -hmm. broad plan would be good enough for me where means end reasoning and all that sort of thing would be filled in later. Okay. Okay. That's, that's very, that's, that's big for me. Okay, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> This is, this is why I get accused of, you know, scary things. I'm worried about it, but I see you, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I love the talk, but it terrified me. So you just <laughs> said you're accused of scary things. I feel scared. So um, my first question is this. You gave us the example of self-defense. You said that we see kind of clearly in this, in this example why we can forfeit rights. So my question is what, do you, what, what kind of rights? Are these moral rights or legal rights? So I can see the traditional debate is I have, uh, I own my body, you own yours, I don't get to touch yours without your permission. This is, this is a moral argument. But legal rights are something entirely different, right? Um, we, we don't forfeit our legal rights, or procedural justice uh, is not meant to allow us to, for, to forfeit our rights. So I'm not sure that the anal analogy holds. I think self-defense is about moral rights, which have repercussion in the law, and your transmission of them to this prevention, detention is uh, troubling for me. And here's the question is one, are we trying to create a new regime of procedural rights that are very individual specific? You, you said many times that we keep wanting to break down um, categories of self-defense, categories of actors, categories of thoughts. So what are the implications for equality before the law in your breaking down exercise? And here's one of the things that's troubling me is that philosophers love to use thought experiments. We used a number of today. We saw babies down the well. Um, and I think the reason we like to do this is because we all instinctually react. We're the types of beings that feel disgust and contempt. Um, and these help us in a philosophy classroom uh, sometimes clarify things. But in the real world, when we have uh, contempt for groups, when we see disgust, um, that translates into, I think, something quite pernicious. And so you use the example of Shriner, but most people in our jails aren't Shriner. Shriner would be an anomaly within our uh, criminal system. So my other question is, what kind of view of the state do we have and what kind of view of the actors within our prisons who are sending people out for parole, who are doing these last interviews? Um, it seems to me you'd have to have a lot of faith in the system to allow this preventative detention and not uh, be concerned that something like race or other categories that we don't seem to acknowledge on the surface but are doing a lot of work in our uh, criminal, in our criminal law working. And then the last Few, oh, last two points is, how do we know that the person changed their mind? Um, you talked about insincerity, so how are we going to test sincerity? Uh, another thing is, I, I, I can't accept that we aren't criminalizing the individual, as you say, uh, when, we, when we preventively deten detent them. I'm not sure it's convincing to say that we don't intend to cause stigma if we do cause stigma. If someone is uh, placed under certain constraints that their families can know about, that um, maybe social workers can know about who allow them to have access to their children that their employers will know about. And then the last question is about fantasy and how do we distinguish between fantasy and intention? Thank you. Okay, um, first I'm talking about moral rights. Um, and, and I actually think something like consent is a great analog to forfeiture. Uh, so if you think that there are different, and in fact, I, I skipped it in the talk, but you know, one, one thing I say is that uh, you know, in the same way that we shouldn't talk about eating when you're hungry and care, covering you know, dinner parties and Les Miserables, you shouldn't talk about self-defense in the same way. So in the same way that you can give someone permission to you know, cro cross a boundary by consent, or you can give up a right by abandonment, I think forfeiture is likewise one of these, um, I think it's a normative power by which you lose certain claim rights for a particular period of time. So you may then say, well, then your confrontation clause case is just a little bit 
too easy, but it's, it's meant to say, look, there, there are sort of sets of baseline entitlements that we think are sort of appropriate in any given situation, and there may be time that by somebody's wrongdoing, you know, they're, they're taking the entitlements and getting them out of whack. And I actually think that that's what forfeiture is about, is the same sort of thing that the person winds up. If you can attack someone, and, not have, and that person can't defend himself, right? There'd be something seriously wrong with, with the way our baseline rights and duties operate. Uh, and so I think forfeiture actually steps in to fix that. Do you think forfeiture applies to procedural justice? I, yes, I do. But I'm not, I'm not talking, I think sometimes it does, sure. Um, it's gonna depend on the case, right? I mean, I don't, I don't see, anything wrong in the confrontation clause case with the claim that if you purposefully kill the witness to prevent the witness from testifying against you that you lose the right to complain about the hearsay coming in. And then it's all a matter of what fitting and appropriate is, right? Fitting and appropriate is gonna do a tremendous amount of work in these cases. Yeah, or act, yeah. Um, so, but I am talking about moral rights and not legal rights. Oops, as I lose this. Um, okay. Um, equality, I take it the equality complaint also goes to the sort of pernicious. I mean, I think we should be really careful about what our law currently looks like, what we're currently doing. We have a lot of preparatory offenses, which I think shouldn't even be crimes. And what we do then is we go into neighborhoods and we, you know, the people who bear the brunt of this, right, are, you know, African Americans, um, the poor, et cetera. So, I mean, we actually have a relatively horrible and pernicious system because, you know, any, any theory can be abused, right? Now, I think that a lot of this stuff shouldn't be criminalized. Now, what happens when you say it's prevention? I don't solve the problem then, I just move it over. But part of the problem is that when we stick things under the criminal law, everybody thinks, ah, that's a crime, right? And no one, no politician can run on, you know, I'm gonna decriminalize all of this stuff, right? But if we said, look, what we're doing is we're actually gonna do prevention. And we need to be careful about prevention. We need to be careful about when we're treating ordinary citizens in certain ways. And you see this, you see this in things like people being annoyed about taking their shoes off at the airport, right? So once it becomes prevention, do we do a better job of this? Maybe, maybe we don't, maybe we do the same job. Maybe we need other procedural guarantees, but I'd at least like it to be in the right category because I think the criminal law is both morally the wrong category and I think politically it incredibly empowers the state to do horrible things to people because no one questions the use of the criminal law. Um, okay, how do we know if they change their mind? Um, yeah, uh, so, Proof of mental states is always going to come from either, uh, you know, looking at external acts during a trial or having the person testify. Uh, proving that you changed your mind is probably easiest if you testify in the same way that currently the abandonment defense re typically requires the defendant to get up there and testify that he abandoned the crime. So I think. <laughs> Close to it, yeah. Um, but um, so you start with the fact that you can't lock the person up if he's already changed his mind. So at the time of sort of the initial action, you would have to prove that the person had the intention. They could then, I think the burden is appropriately on the, the sort of defendant or whatever you want to call that person to have that person say, you know, I've changed my mind. You shouldn't lock me up or pay, atten pay attention to me. After that, you probably review it in six months, and you actually put the burden on the state to show that there's a continued intention at the time. Uh, and you can change burdens of proofs, you can have automatic step downs for anything that isn't something we're incredibly scared of. So we could say, even if you've been locked up, now you're going on electronic monitoring, now you're going to re curfew reporting, et cetera. So we could gauge that based on the kind of threat the person is and the kind of crime at issue, uh, how we do all of that. I mean, admittedly, you know, working out the mechanics of this is not easy, right, from the theory of the state will presto let you go, and how do we actually measure this and make sure that we're as minimally over-inclusive and under-inclusive as possible. Um, and the, those are obviously real problems. Um, intending versus foreseeing. Um, 
the stigma. So we have plenty of things. This, when the state locks people up because they're mentally ill, we know that stigma comes from that. We don't intend it. It's not criminal. Uh, what it means when we foresee stigma, when we're gonna impose stigma, is that we should have high burdens before we engage in the action. It's exactly why I wind up with something like proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, is the question of, once you're weighing all of these things, what kind of burden should be on the state before uh, it, it actually starts to intervene and interfere with someone else. So yes, the stigma as a side effect is still obviously a consideration. It just doesn't make it the criminal law. Fantasy. So one of the you know, great cases that I didn't talk about and we'll have to figure out how to one day is the, you know, the cannibal cop, right? I mean, that, that makes you know, throwing babies down a well nothing, right? I mean, does, any, does everybody, there's a cop who, no, how did you miss? So there was a cop who was in a chat room talking about how he wanted to kidnap women, rape them and then cannibalize them. And there were discussions about slow cooking the woman over a fire because it would hurt her for the, I mean, it was terrible, terrible stuff. And so of course, then the question is, it, you know, the argument of his attorney was this was all just really disgusting fantasy and not intention. Um, Two separate questions, right? There's a really hard proof problem here, right? It's part of the reason we want acts. It's part of the reason we might go from my saying any act is good enough to saying maybe we want more so we can be certain we actually had an intention and not a fantasy. Um, sometimes when it's just talk, maybe he doesn't know whether it's intention and fantasy. And I think one of the reasons we wind up with an act requirement is actually to sever the intention fantasy line. But it's, it's a difficult question, right? And he certainly could get very far along uh, and still perhaps not even know himself. Um, but that's, that's gonna be a question with, with any time we have somebody who has something, some very creepy mindset and we don't know whether he'll follow through until the very moment he does. Um. She, um, I'd like to press a bit on the question of, about stigma uh, because uh, I have this intuition that uh, there are two different ways of making sense of what stigma actually is. For example, from the philosophy of action perspective, you could say that stigma is a kind of, is either the object or actually the very reactive attitude in, in, in reactive attitude in, in, in Peter Strawson's way of understanding reactive attitudes as such as blaming or disapproving or indignation and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if that is the case and, and, and stigma is actually the attitude itself, the reactive attitude itself, then for example, you cannot understand stigma for you know, uh, mentally disturbed people in asylums or whatever in the same way as you would understand it in the criminal setting, precisely because in this first case, there's no reactive attitude involved. It's just more like a property and not a reactive attitude. But if it is a property, and here's the second way of understanding stigma, then, then what you actually have to ask is, what are the property makers? What makes it the case that someone has a stigma? And then, for example, you could equally dispute whether there is real stigma in the case of, for example, someone who's mentally incapacitated and, you know, and kept under custody for that reason, whether we are really talking about stigma or about, I don't know, something else that isn't really captured by the notion of stigma. So we have the reactive attitude on the one hand and the property understanding of stigma. And I think that that, that has some, you know, purchase with regard to this question. Can I just ask what you would, what would the payoff be, do you think, of the different? Um, so if we think it's the reactive attitude. If it's the reactive people, attitude, um, in the case of preventing force, because you were saying that in, in the instance of the use of preventing force, there is no real intention to attribute stigma. Is that right? Yeah. So if we theorize that stigma is not a reactive attitude, then the argument goes really well. But what about if it's a property instead of a reactive attitude? Isn't there, doesn't, doesn't this open up the door for much more substantive argument about what stigma is? What is the function of stigma in criminal law? Whether stigma, the, the scope of the concept of stigma can be uh, used in so different categories like a criminal offender and, 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 and the person who is not in control of his own mind and all the rest. 
I mean, that's interesting. I mean, the question would be then whether it, if we look at it that way, what does the civil criminal line look like? And then what should follow from that, right? Do we think that criminal should follow the property in a way that it winds up including other sorts of cases? What, what warrants attributing this property? Huh? What are the property makers of stigma? What, what, what makes someone the bearer of stigma in that sense? Huh? Yeah. I'll have to think more about that. Thank you. Um, so, let me start by, by saying that uh, my view of it in general about law is that it's all about welfare and the whole justification of law is about welfare. So, so I start from a very, very different perspective to you. But let's assume that I'm wrong about that and that criminal law is, is not about welfare and about, but about criminal response, but about more responsibility. Um, even then, I, I would, so, so my question to you, my first question is why, why would, why think of, of uh, prevention in, as an extension of, of criminal law in the way that you did, or, or, of, or forfeiture in the way that you did, and not as uh, part of what the welfare state does? And now, unless you think that all of the welfare state is, is, can be explained as some kind of extension of more responsibility, then um, you know, we think that the state has, I mean, you, you may disagree with that, but many people think, I, I for one think, that the state has certain obligations for us to, you know, to make our lives in certain ways uh, good and safe and secure. And part of the things that the state has to, or part of the ways in which the state, uh, that our lives bec may become insecure is by other people. And so here's another story uh, that may justify, and I would think uh, at least as good a contender, of, um, Prevention. Now, I'm, I'm not arguing that actually you can make the argument for that, but, but in terms of the structure of the argument, the story that I will, I will go to tell, it will be a story that, that talks about uh, the obligations of the welfare state um, towards us. So that's my first question. The second question is about the criminal law versus um, retributivism. So, so you say, well, I don't want to call this, it, it may look like criminal law because I will bring in all the procedural and for, uh, uh, mechanisms that, that are part of the criminal. Um, and it will, you know, conduct it in, in, in a way. People will end up in prison. You know, you will not call it punishment, but they will end up in prison. Um, but I don't want to call it criminal law. And, and so my question to you, is it simply that you're so committed to your theory of, of criminal law is purely or is about retributivism? Uh, that you're unwilling to see that. So, so, so here's, uh, in, in a way, it's, 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 it's my general question about conceptual argument. So there's always the possible move here between saying either we hold our theory fixed and therefore what doesn't fit our theory is not criminal law, or we say, um, no, we look at the practice and we say, that looks like criminal law, it, it feels like criminal law and all that, which suggests that the theory that suggests that criminal law is only about retributive justice is, is mistaken, so. Okay, so in terms of the first question and sort of the, the welfare state, um, so there are gonna be a bunch of people that my theory doesn't cover, right? Because some people who will harm us will harm us for all sorts of reasons that will never rise to the level of culpable intentions, and so, my theory has no answer to that, right? I mean, this actually started out as a, gee, you know, people keep think, thinking it's dessert or disease. Why isn't anybody talking about this interesting thing going on in self-defense? I'm gonna fill in this gap. Um, but that isn't to say that there won't be times that we do peer prevention. I mean, it's just not my project. I concede we'll have to do peer prevention. The question is, when we shoot large men coming down wells or lock people up for our safety, you know, we're gonna have different questions about the compensation we owe them, where we lock them up, how this is supposed to work, that, are, that will be different in, in, in kind from the cases where people forfeit rights. And certainly any theory that wants to get at everybody who will harm us has to also offer something for that. I'm just not answering that question right now. But if, if you have a justice-based theory of the welfare state, then it doesn't mean that, so, so you may say, you know, there may be diseases against which the state should pr protect us. Um, and there may also be sometimes other kinds of risk. And because sometimes those risks come from people, that may 
require the state to behave differently from as uh, from the way it would it should behave against viruses but but that does not mean that there isn't a, st a welfare state based story about prevention so so i um, so in a way all my question is is you you said that's the only or the most plausible story to tell about why the state might be justified in in prevent in in uh locking people up prior mm -hmm. to crime. And I say, well, here's, here's an, I suggest you an alternative story and, and that I think is at least as attractive, so. I'm just, and your story is that the welfare state, is this about culpable people or just even innocent people? Is this, I mean, so we predict that in a month you're, you're going to form an intention. What do we do with you? Is there a story about what the welfare state can do to you now? Well, within a story about, you know, what are the limits of the state in mm -hmm. general, about what the state can and cannot do, uh, it, there may be a story to tell about, yes, the extent to which uh, the, I mean, it seems just to me a more natural way to go about. So, so if, if we think that, that the state has certain obligations towards us with regard to the security of our lives in general. So our lives may become insecure as a result of earthquakes. It may become insecure as a result of uh, uh, viruses of certain kinds. And it may become insecure as a result of the attacks of other people. Um, and if the story that we tell about why the state may be justified in acting in certain ways to prevent earthquakes if there is a story to be told about that question, I'm suggesting that there may be a similar story to be told uh, about why it's justified in... in... Yeah, I, I just wonder whether we're just so far apart on how we see people and rights that, you know, you, you, our views wouldn't marry up. Now, let me, let me answer, though, the second part, which is that you want to say, look, Kim, you just have criminal law wrong, right? Like, the, the move is, like, e I can either say this is outside the criminal law, or I can just embrace it and say, we were just wrong about what we thought criminal law was. Um, then we have to, we still, I think, would want to ask questions about what we're doing to people and why we're doing it, and whether prevent, and then there's the question, do you want to put preventive goals in the same category as dessert goals because they sometimes look the same or is it better to separate them out because we'll be more just that way, right? I mean, I, I actually think there are interesting questions about psychopaths, right? So I don't think psychopaths are worthy of moral uh, dessert or blame, um, but I also think that they're, you know, they're probably, in, I'm afraid of what Emily will say when I say they're entitled to less rights. Um, and we may in fact be able to just lock them up like we'd lock up scary tigers. And then the question is, do you lock them up in the criminal law with, with the criminals or do you put them somewhere else and does it matter? And we may think that it does matter. We may think that the state winds up having more respect from its citizens and being more just if we keep our justifications separate. And I'm, I mean, if, we wind up marrying them. I want to see the argument for why we put these things together. Um, but it's certainly a move available to someone to say it's all you know. I just you know I'm just being stingy with the label criminal, and it's just another debate like liability about how specific we want to be, um, given those two. Uh, so I kind of want to suggest the, a third possibility. All right. And so uh, you brought up the idea of monitoring, right? So uh, what I'm curious is, so somebody expresses an intent to perform some horrible crime. What justifies you beyond monitoring to go to the extent of detention? I can see an easy case to say that uh, you have, the, the government is authorized and maybe even has a duty to expend high amounts of resources uh, to, to go into monitoring this person to be sure that they're not going to take the steps towards committing the crime. So to take the Shriner example, that he wasn't going to purchase a, a van or something. But why uh, is it necessary to go to the step that the person should be detained? I, I don't think it necessarily is in 
most cases, right? So the, the question, I mean, the, the interesting question is probably not the Shriner cases, it's the terrorism cases, right? It's the concern about if this person has exposure to the outside world, what can they continue to plot and plan in such ways that we should be really worried? But I always think that we should do the, less restric the least restrictive means possible. Uh, and you, I think you're exactly right to say that in terms of what the state owes us all, that in fact, we may in fact want to spend resources and making sure we don't lock people up when we can do less restrictive means. There may come a point where the kind of, you know, you have to ask questions about, you know, how many video cameras we want out in public that can watch our every move. But certainly that will be less restrictive on all of us than other things. And so technology is always going to shift the boundaries of what's possible and, and what kind of rights and interferences we wind up with. So I'm with you to the extent we can do more rights mon uh, electronic monitoring. Let's do it. That would be great. Right. Uh, I, I mean, but 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 it seems that you you you're saying more than that. You're saying that so long as the person does have the intent, we are permitted to detain them. No, I'm saying that for as long as they have the intent, we're permitted to stop them, and then that we can stop them. We, to stop them, we have to use the least restrictive means that we think will avert the threat. I mean, look, there's going to be probability questions here, right, about what we think and what the probabilities of each of those things are. But I mean, if I'm about to shoot John and he can either shoot me or step on my foot and get me to drop the gun, I think he has to shoot, step on my foot. I don't think he can kill me. But it, unless the person moves from the stage of setting a goal to taking a step, how are you preventing them in any way? That's, I don't understand that. Well, your inter, so, so your thought is that until you, um, if you're not locking them up, you're not actually stopping them, until, right? They can still keep going. Until you act, there's nothing to stop. Well, I think the, the so my thought would be that you are, you're, maybe you're not stopping. You're slowing them down substantially by the fact that you're keeping them from accessing, to the extent you do something like a stay away order or electronic monitor or something, you can keep an eye on where they are or where they're going, et cetera. Right? I mean, I think that's, but that's different. keeping an eye is different than slowing down because there has to be a transition from forming the intent to acting to, for, for a harm to be slowed down. I mean, at this point, it's just a possibility that the harm will occur. And it might be a strong reason, I think, to say that the state has a huge duty to, to, to take steps to make sure such a threat doesn't materialize that that possible threat doesn't turn into an actual one. But until the person starts taking actual uh, measures, steps, moving towards taking that action, there is no threat to stop. There's no actual threat to stop. There's just a merely potential threat. Well, but, but now we're talking about what, I, I'm worried we're in a debate about what it means to be a threat, right? I mean, you form an intention and so you have a plan to cause harm X. And I've got two theories about why you're not, why I'm allowed to harm you now, right? One, one theory is you're culpable and you will cause that harm. And because in the future you will cause that harm. If we're doing straight fact relative, we're not doing evidence relative, fact relative, you will cause that harm unless you're stopped. I'm allowed to stop you, right? And I can stop you, you have no right against me stopping you, even if you haven't walked closer or closer to it, because you're going to do it. Second theory, you've caused me fear that you're going to do it. And since you've put me in this epistemic position, I'm entitled to stop the threat I perceive. Yeah, okay, so, so maybe uh, I, you know, the, the word threat is, is clouding the issue. But the, the idea is that there is some, when somebody acts, when they start to act, there's an event that will occur uh, unless some preventative measure is taking place to mm -hmm. stop them, right? That's not necessarily the case with just forming a goal. The goals can be transitory. You could just change your mind. Like, you could be having a, a bad day and you come up with this horrible goal and then you just, so I mean, but I mean, at least as a theor theoretical matter, I mean, it seems like your theory uh, would say that at that moment, that person, I mean, obviously the practical issues aside, but at that moment, that person can be detained so long as that, 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 that intent is in their mind. And that just, 
So, you, so what you don't know is that the kind of argument you're making is exactly why Larry Alexander and I argue against punishing incomplete attempts, right? We get very nervous about punishing people for what they might never do, right? And there's actually this sort of interesting tension in my work between how I treat incomplete attempts, where I don't want to punish people, because you could change your mind and never do the crime, and the fact that I think you can intervene. But I think that for so long as that person has that intention, Right? He does lack standing against people who are trying to just stop it. And in, if we were, were omniscient, it's either that he's really going to cause the harm, and that's why it's OK, or because by cause, culpably causing that belief, he's also forfeited rights. That second one right, isn't grounded in the threat that will eventually occur, but in the fact that he's culpable for causing the belief. Thank you. I don't, I, I don't think you're satisfied, but... No, but if we could talk later. Okay. Hi, thanks. So you've been saying that you don't want this to be under the criminal law, but under a different sort of preventative scheme. And I guess I'm wondering whether we want it to be under law at all. So uh, I guess if you think that maybe we go along, let's say we go along with your int intentions in the sort of interpersonal case, and we think, yeah, absolutely, they've kind of given up their, their right, and I can stop them, I can do something. So I can grab your arm to stop you putting rat poison in the cup, that's perfectly fine. But I don't think that we think that I can then go around locking this person up forever or following them around all the time to make sure that they do, don't do the things that I, they're intending to do. So I'm just not sure that the intuition that you get in that case actually translates to something very different like law, which is such a sort of pervasive scheme of power that has a different kind of ability to kind of constrict people in very different ways than the individual can. So, um, and, and I think this also draws on, on Chris's point about how the, the, the stopping is very different than the sort of detaining and watching and what are we supposed to do. Um, so it's definitely true that in most cases we, in self-defense, we stop, you know, we just, you know, the, the criticism I've gotten is you stop them in your tracks and then you're done, right? And that's not what this regime looks like. But there, there are a couple reasons for that. I mean, mainly because the state's already involved. So what we think is supposed to happen is that if you suspect someone is trying to kill you, you're not supposed to shoot them, you're supposed to call the cops, right? And if you're worried about them after the fact, you go get a restraining order because the law is supposed to intervene to protect you in all sorts of ways, right? And so you don't, in fact, um, need to keep following the guy around. Um, the, the case I think that puts the most pressure on your position, it's not a case, it's a, is the, actually the play, Extremity. So it's, it was a Farrah Fawcett movie in the 80s. Um, but the play is basically about a man, Raul, who breaks in to, to rape a woman, Marjorie. And she sprays him with bug spray and sticks him in the fireplace. Um, and ties him up and stick, she doesn't set him on fire, she just sticks him there. And you know, the, the, the um, roommates come home and everything. And whenever the roommates aren't around, he just taunts her with, the minute I get out of jail, I'm going to kill you. And she really believes him. And there's this real tension of, I'm not turning him into the cops. I'm just gonna keep him here. He's never, you know, at one point she says, he's never leaving this house. And, you know, I think that we would wonder if we had a state that wasn't functioning well, whether or not Marjorie would just be allowed to keep Raul in that fireplace until the minute he actually renounced his intentions. You know, but, but it's certainly true that what the state does is broader, it's not as immediate, and in fact, it monitors slightly differently than the way that we do in self-defense. But the question is, is the underlying grounds, the loss of the right, the, it does, is that working the same way? And then there might be spin-offs of differences because of the way we've apportioned power between citizens and states, and because of what states owe all of their citizens, uh, and why they don't get just to line everybody up and shoot them because they might, you know, harm us one day. We're going to do whatever we can to try and keep people in society as much as possible. Thanks. Hey, Kim, I think this is probably the same line of questioning. Uh, having, I, I, I'm really thinking a little bit about what Chris said. And um, so uh, it seems to me you're, you're, you're clearly not a fan of the imminence requirement in self-defense, right? I'm a fan of this, right? I think even if it's necessary, you don't do it until it's imminent. Uh, so I don't think that the imminence requirement collapses into the necessity defense. But ne never mind whether I think that. It, here's a reason why somebody might think that. They might think that for the same reason we shouldn't intervene 
to punish people before they're actually attempting, we shouldn't intervene to stop somebody before they're actually embarking. And um, th that reason is that we should trust people to change their minds even when we suspect they won't. Or we should credit them with the capacity to change their minds, or something like that. It's a common thought. Now, I don't even know whether that's my thought. I just know that uh, when there was talk of uh, invading Iraq because of weapons of mass destruction, my reaction was not, there aren't weapons of mass destruction, even though that later turned out the case. My, my thought was, we have to wait till they're launched, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I, I'm interested that you don't share that intuition, given the strong feelings you have about, about attempts. Um, so I'm obviously on a different wavelength from you about how these two topics relate, uh, prevention and punishment. I think they have sort of the same logic of, uh, of ignition. Uh, you know, the, it's the same point, really, that we get to do this stuff, whether it's prevention or punishment, which is a good reason to keep the two institutions as one. We, do, we perform both functions through the criminal law, and we're allowed to start performing them at the same point. And all this pressure to create preparatory, defense, uh, pr preparatory offenses is a violation on both sides. We shouldn't be punishing that early, but we also shouldn't be preventing that early. So, I mean, I think of imminence as potentially serving three different functions. Um, one is that we tend to think of it as this proxy for necessity, right? Um, and I have problems with the fact that then it just sort of collapses into necessity. Um, I think that sometimes imminence is about apportioning power between citizens and states. And I think that imminence, particularly in cases where you're not dealing with culpable aggression, winds up being uh, an, actus, uh, an actus reus requirement, right? I actually think it's an over-inclusive actus reus requirement, but there's this question about, well, if one person's gonna assure the other person's destruction, you know, how do you know who the aggressor and the defender you know, are without some sort of act requirement? So, but, and, and I do recognize that this puts a lot of pressure on early intervention. I think that what, the way that I've been thinking about this is that there's a difference between what we want in terms of fact, our fact relative position and what we do in terms of evidence relative rules in you know, an imperfect world. So the question, if we knew the person would either kill you or not kill you, you would know immediately, you know, then it seems to me that there'd be no reason to wait, right? You wouldn't owe him anything in a world of perfect knowledge. But that what happens is that we wind up creating rules in terms of what we owe each other. You might change your mind, you might not do this, I might be wrong, and so we wind up with something closer to this imminence requirement. I know this is a necessity sort of argument, right? That we, we owe, in the same way that we might owe each other proof beyond a reasonable doubt before we lock someone up, we may want some other requirement in self-defense because of this evidence relative standard. Um, but I think, I think prevention is different than punishment because I do think that punishment is based on, the question of when somebody deserves something just may not be the moment at which someone forfeits rights. I don't, I don't know why those two would have to rise and fall together. Well, well, as you can guess, I think that the, the considerations of desert that you think are relevant to punishment are also relevant to prevention, and I think they're relevant to self-defense too, in the case of the culpable aggressor. Mm -hmm. I, like you, I think that there are different principles for different cases, so I don't want to overgeneralize and get into fights with Jeff McMahon about it, but, <laughs> but in that narrow class of cases, I think that the desert considerations are also relevant, so it's tempting for me to say that the imminence requirement is a proxy for that rather than a proxy for necessity. I, I want there to be necessity in punishment as well. So, uh, so these, uh, these moves are just gradually bringing the topics closer together in a way that you want to drive them more apart. And I suppose that's in keeping with the, the tradition of thinking that the criminal law can consistently be ambivalent <laughs> about its purposes, which I'm naturally hospitable to that it can keep prevention alive among its driving forces. And, but I mean, that's just a, a mm -hmm. naked right. attack on your position, that's, that's all it is. Um, so yes, but so, so I, I mean, I think, you're, I think you're right that the, the image requirement is clearly a proxy for something. It's just a question what it's a proxy for. I'm not sure that it's a proxy for the things that you described. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, it, and I think it may do different, th I think it may actually not be a proxy for one thing. I think imminence may be doing a lot of different work at the same time, that if we got rid of it, we'd, we'd still need five different principles. Uh, I just have uh, two questions. The first one is just a matter of clarity, uh, distinguishing between uh, the preventative regime and a criminal regime. I've been understanding you to be I understand you to be able to distinguish between the two regimes procedurally uh, as a matter of, uh, let's say, different procedures regarding disgorgement, right? So the preventative regime would necessarily be a provisional disgorgement of rights, right? Whereas the criminal regime, if we're talking about dessert, we'd be talking about a set degree or amount of disgorgement, right, as fitting the crime. So you have a nice, clean procedural distinction at that level. Is that Somewhere around. I think I, I don't think of it quite the same way, but I think I agree with you so far. Okay, so just that, that was just the first question in terms of clarity. Uh, the second question regards uh, it, it's more let's call it probing um, regarding the concepts at play uh, and implementation of this preventative regime. I think one of the things that has people worried, as I've understand a number of the questions, is this idea of intention in prevention. When we're talking, uh, let's talk about the application of a preventative regime. And we don't have to worry about prison, we can just talk about a simple disgorgement of, of rights. When is it legitimate to disgorge rights? If we talk about intention, I think, I, maybe I'm wrong here, um, you would want to tie that to when a person actually has an intention. So we would disgorge to the extent that they have an intention. Right? But one of the things that people are very good at, and it's just a function of the world, is that we flip-flop, we waffle, we move between intentions. So one of the questions at a, at a practical level of implementation would be, can we track their existing intentions? And the answer that I think you're forced to answer is no, not perfectly. We have to have a different kind of evidential procedure. Right? I worry, and, and this is not necessarily critical, you might agree with me, but, uh, or agree with the possibility, accept the possibility. Are we really talking here about a preventative regime being tied to character? and being tied to character in a way that Anthony Duff talks about it, right? where it's a function of action to some degree and also a function of held beliefs, attitudes, and the rest of it. Right? I mean, you can see, say we're talking about a tribunal establishing whether a disgorgement is justified. Right? It's impossible for them to assess whether at the moment in court even, this person really does, at time t, have the relevant intention. They can't do that. I mean, you're talking about the burden of proof. The burden of proof would have to be to whether we can presume this person has an ongoing intention or maybe will waffle in and out of an ongoing intention, whether they will come back to the plan, even if they've temporarily left it. So I just wonder if that, what you think about that, is this an inevitability on your understanding? And if so, does that change the justificatory landscape? Because you, it's, it's one thing to say that we're justified in disgorging rights to the extent that somebody has an intention. It's a very different thing to say that we can disgorge rights to the extent that somebody has a character of a particular kind. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to think where to start. I think that we are sometimes more skeptical of the ability to prove intention than we perhaps should be. Right? In terms of our daily interactions, in terms of court cases, I, I actually think that proving intention or, or getting at intention is not as hard as we might sometimes think it is. Now, true, flip-flops are a big problem. Again, why I don't like incomplete attempts, right? It's one of the reasons people can change their minds and they can go back and forth. And if they go back and forth, is that a bunch of crimes or just one crime and how would we possibly think about it? I think those are really hard questions for the criminal law. So, so, sorry, but, the, but the, yeah, under my system, right? So then you've got my system where it's so, supposed to be, can you, state can interfere, now it can't, now it can't, now it can't, right? Every time you change your mind, that's very problematic. What I suggest in the paper is that you would check in at some certain set period of time. So you would obviously wind up being over-inclusive to the extent that somebody uh, has dropped an intention, but you haven't put them up for review yet. Um, in terms of punishing for character, I mean, I mean, we certainly have to worry about this generally. Um, I am not opposed to once the state has shown that someone has an intention through the right sort of means, right, without using things like character evidence that are not permissible, 
that once we have shown the person had the intention, that we could use evidence to show the person continues to have the intention through sort of psychological statistics and the, and the like. I actually think that continuing that might, at that point, might be justified. Um, I still don't think it punishes someone for character. I think it's not about who you are. I think it's about what you're choosing to do. Um, but we have to set certain burdens of proof, et cetera, to make sure we get the right balance between you know, type one and type two errors and what we owe people in terms of standards, right? I mean, that's part of the reason you wind up with something like proof beyond a reasonable doubt instead of you know, clear and convincing evidence or a preponderance of the evidence is, do we, you know, once we're looking at the kind of evidence we have to use, how much, do we, how much proof do we have to have before we, we start interfering with someone's liberty? I, and I don't, I don't pretend that any of this is remotely you know, easy, and I, I don't have rose-colored glasses on about it. It's more a matter of, I think that this is, these are the right questions to ask, and hiding this under the criminal law, so we say, oh, we don't have to ask that. Those aren't the right questions, you know, or we're not asking the questions. And so, yes, these things should worry us, but let's at least cast them in the sunlight and, and be worried. Yeah. I, I just think that then, if you move away from, say, it, it doesn't even matter if you take a, a character-driven evidential burden or you take a probabilities burden. I mean, this is what freaks people out, right? It's one thing to say, so long as they have the intention, we disgorge the rights. It's another thing to say, probabilistically, we're going to take your rights away. And I think that is, is one of the things that's very discomforting uh, as an audience. But, but thank you very much. Sure, thank you. OK, so we're just about out of time. So let's uh, all thank Professor Frizan. A great talk. <laughs> Uh, we've, we've, I was just going to thank all of you. Yeah. These were fantastic questions. We've also put together a token of our appreciation for Professor Frizan and also for Professor Gardner for coming here and talking to us at this conference. Uh, Caroline has got them there. Uh, yeah. I think he's afraid of me now. I <laughs> Thanks again, everybody, for coming up. Any great questions.